Good evening, everyone. Thank you for continuing to join us on our third workshop for today. So, Pastor Kim K will continue his sharing for the part three of this workshop. So, before I pass this time to him, I have one announcement. If you guys have any question, feel free to type down your question. So, remember, you have question. Type down your question in the, yeah, in the chat box below. The one that's a Q&A. So, so let's have a, a word of prayer before I pass this time to Pastor Kim. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for continuing to sustain us throughout the day. I want to continue to ask for your outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be with Pastor Kim as he's going to share that whatever that comes out from his mouth is from you and the message that he's delivered is the message that you want us to hear, Lord. I want to pray for all the participants that you also pour your spirit to us, that we are willing, our heart is softened to listen to your words and to let your words transform us. And help us not to have a humbleness of heart and help us not to stay focused throughout the workshop. And thank you so much for listening. In this name I pray. Amen. So I pass this time to Pastor Kim. Well, good evening once again. Uh, so I hope you're enjoying all the meetings, uh, all the effort that's gone into putting to be with you each evening. As we look uh, at the last night, we've um, talked about getting some questions in where we've got another session tomorrow evening. And then uh, on Thursday night, we're going to be taking some, some questions and try to be able to answer them from the scriptures. So if you have any, any questions about what we've been covering here in this particular, uh, this particular session, the, the sessions that I've been doing, just put them in there in the question Q&A uh, area, and then we'll try and, and get biblical answers for you uh, coming up on Thursday night. As we look at the last couple of evenings, Paul has proved that Jesus is the Messiah. And he went to the Old Testament, and there he says from the Old Testament scriptures, he proved that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. And we saw from uh, Daniel chapter 9, the dates of 457 BC, and also the dates of 27 AD. And these were extremely important dates. Well, why? You know, why is 457? Why are 27 so important? Well, our dear friends in the, uh, the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches, they'll say that these dates uh, are 444 BC when this command to restore Jerusalem went ahead. Or they'll say that it's uh, 29 AD when uh, Tiberius was the 15th year of Tiberius. Or they'll say uh, 30 AD is when Jesus came, or 33 AD, any time other than the true dates. Well, here's the real problem. If 457 BC is not the date that the commandment went forth to restore and build Jerusalem, then 27 AD is not the year that would Messiah would come. And if 457 and 27 AD are not true, then 1844 is not true either, because it's part of this larger prophecy. And if there's no investigative judgment as a result of uh, the finishing up the 2300 days in 1844, if there's no investigative judgment, then there's really no sanctuary in heaven. And if there's no sanctuary in heaven, then there's no most holy place in heaven. And if there's no most holy place in heaven, there's no Ark of the Covenant. And if there's no Ark of the Covenant, then there's no law of God contained in that Ark. And if there's no law of God, well, then there's no Seventh-day Sabbath. And if there's no Seventh-day Sabbath, people are going to be saying at the end, you know, why are you so uh, stubborn. Why are you taking this stand when the whole world realizes that it's the first day of the week? So these dates are extremely important because they're, they uh, are the platform for 
our other ideas. And this attack on the sanctuary doctrine is just going to get more intense as time goes on. Now, I wanted to share this with you from uh, the book Evangelism, page 67. Every position of truth taken by our people will bear the criticism of the greatest minds. The highest of the world's great men will be brought in contact with truth. And therefore, every position we take should be critically examined and tested by the scriptures. Now we seem to be unnoticed, but this will not always be. Movements are at work to bring us to the front. And if our theories of truth can be picked to pieces by historians or the world's greatest men, it will be done. We must individually know for ourselves what is truth and be prepared to give a reason of the hope that we have with meekness and fear, not in a proud, boasting self-sufficiency, but with the Spirit of Christ. We are nearing the time when we shall stand individually alone for, uh, to answer for our belief. <clears throat> and so these, uh, these prophecies here, these uh, dates, 457, uh, 31, we're uh, pardon me, we're going to study about 31 this evening. Uh, these dates are critical to our belief, to the platform of truth that we stand on. So we need to know why we believe uh, what we believe. And Paul proved that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the uh, anointed one of Scripture. <clears throat> we saw uh, that Jesus was baptized in the year 27 AD, in the, in the autumn of that year, and he became the anointed one. And immediately after his baptism, he was driven by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness where he was tempted there for 40 days. And once he was finished with that temptation and he had won the victory for us there over appetite and love of the world and, and, and self-worship, etc., he came back into the area of Galilee and he stood up for to read in the synagogue and he more or less announced the time is fulfilled. From Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He announced that he was the Messiah. And so this sequence here in 27 AD, the baptism of Jesus, his temptation in the wilderness, his announcing that he's the Messiah, this is a very important uh, sequence in Bible prophecy. This time prophecy that was being fulfilled was the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. So let's go there, Daniel the ninth chapter. We'll just again review a couple of these verses. Daniel chapter 9, and we want to look at verse 24 and 25 again. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. Seventy weeks, I'm reading Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined or set aside upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And so we want to take a look here at this uh, <clears throat> chart again and notice that in 457 BC, that's when the decree went forward to uh, restore and build Jerusalem. And then 69 of those 70 weeks, 483 years would bring us to 27 AD. That was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And history and archeology span as we studied last evening uh, confirm that 27, the fall, the autumn, pardon me, <laughs> I get mixed up with that. 
because uh, we say fall here in America and, and autumn is uh, what I should be saying. So the autumn of 27 AD, history and archaeology confirm that 27 AD, the, the, the autumn, pardon me, of 27 AD is the time when the Messiah came. Okay, now let's read on in verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now, if you notice this chart here, it's broken up into a seven week and then a 62 week and then a one week. And Gabriel is telling Daniel that after the 62 week portion, the three score and two week portion, Messiah is going to be cut off. So he's going to be cut off sometime in this last week. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, the middle of this last week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So after this 62-week portion, during the final week, that is when the Messiah is going to be cut off. So we want to take a look now at this uh, final week here, this final seven-year time frame that goes from the autumn of 27 AD until 34 AD. And it's in the midst of this final week that Messiah is going to be cut off. So the middle of seven is three and a half. It's split in two. Seven divided by two is three and a half. And it's in the middle of this week. So if we go from the autumn of 27 AD, three and a half years into the future, that's going to bring us to the spring of AD 31. Well, what happened in the midst of the week? What happened in the spring of AD 31? Messiah was going to be cut off. Messiah was going to die for your sin and my sin. He was going to be cut off, not for himself, but for the sins of the world. So in the spring of 31 AD, this is when Jesus suffered for our sins. Well, what event in the Jewish economy is happening in the spring of every year? It was the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. The sacrifice of the Passover began there in Exodus. So we want to take a look at this feast here um, in Exodus chapter 12. So let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in verse 24. And this is talking about the night that the nation of Israel were going to leave Egypt. God was going to deliver them. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 24. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep the service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? Then ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. So the Passover was the great deliverance of the families of Israel from Egypt. They sacrificed uh, a lamb there, and they ate it, and then God opened the way that they could be delivered. And as long as they were in the house and uh, the blood was on the doorposts, 
then they were safe. The firstborn were safe. So what's going to happen in this particular Passover? As in future generations, children would ask, why are we doing this? What, what's the meaning of this service? So we go back up to the first verse, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. This is important. And it shall be the first month of the year to you. So the Jewish calendar is going to begin in the spring of the year. It's, this month is going to be the beginning of the year for you, the first month of the year. Speak ye unto the con all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make you count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. So they set it aside on the tenth day, and then they are going to keep it until the fourteenth day of this first month, the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now this is uh, <clears throat> an important word. It's, it's translated here uh, in the King James Version, kill it in the evening. But the original word means between the evenings. And you may have a marginal reference in your Bible that, that shows that it can be translated between the evenings. Now, in the uh, Jewish way of reckoning time, they saw that the sun would begin to go down around noon. And so they considered that sort of the beginning of an evening. And then the, the sun was fully down around six o'clock. And that was then the other evening. So sometime between those two points, between noon and six o'clock in the evening, that's between the evenings. So this is when the Passover lamb was to be killed. Verse seven says, and they shall take of the blood and strike it to the two side posts on the upper door of the posts of the house, wherein ye shall eat it. So they were uh, to take this um, blood from the Passover lamb that they were to kill on the, between the evenings on the 14th day, and they were put it on the two side posts and on the upper door post, the lintel, sometimes people call it, and then they needed to be inside and eat this Passover lamb. And we're going to get some more instruction about the Passover as we go to the book now of Leviticus. So uh, next book here, Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll look at verse 27. Leviticus 23 and verse 27. There it says, there shall, the, pardon me, I'm reading from verse four. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse four. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. So the fourteenth day of the first month was considered the Passover. And that was the time when they were to kill uh, the lamb between the evenings. Now, verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye shall eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. So this was considered a holy gathering. Ye shall do no servile work therein. In other words, it was a day of rest. It was a Sabbath. 
and so you were not supposed to work on this particular day. So this was the 15th day of the first month. The 14th day was to kill the Passover. The 15th day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the beginning of it anyway, and that was a Sabbath. They were to do no work in that day. We read on in verse 9. Verse 9 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow, or the morning after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So now on the 16th day, they were to take a sheaf of barley. Barley harvest was in the spring. They were to take some of the first ripe harvest, <clears throat> and they were to go to the sanctuary, and they were to wave it before the Lord to be accepted of them. So this all happened in the very first month, the 14th day between the evenings. They were to kill the Passover. The 15th day was a Sabbath. They were not to do any work. The Feast of Unleavened Bread began. And then the next day, the, the day after the Sabbath, the 16th day, they were to bring some uh, a sheaf of barley and wave it before the Lord. So now we're going to look here. I'm just going to uh, place it up on the screen. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 1. And we'll notice here the name of this first month of the year. Deuteronomy 16.1 says, Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. So how did they know that this was the first month? Well, God told them it was uh, this would be the first month, the month of the Passover would be the first month to you. And <clears throat> a month actually means in Hebrew, a new moon. So every time a new moon came along, that was considered the beginning of a new month. Of course, a new moon is, is the time when the moon is, is dark and you can't really see it, but this was the beginning of the month. And then it's called the month of Abib. Now the word Abib, uh, if you look it up in a concordance, is uh, to mean to be tender or growing green, the green ears of barley. So when we look at the month of Abib, we're really looking for the new moon, the time of year, the new moon, the month of the green ears, or the month when the harlot or with the barley is just beginning to get ripe. So we're looking for a new moon just prior to the barley harvest because they've got to be able to take a sheaf of barley and wave it before the Lord on the 16th day. So how do we determine when the new moon is and when the beginning of the month is? Because we've got to know when the 14th, 15th, and 16th days are. How do we determine a new moon? Well, <laughs> the rabbinical Jews calculated it because this is what a new moon looks like. If you look up into the night sky, you can't see it. There's no sun shining on it. You can't see the astronomical or the calculated new moon. Astronomers weren't there, so they've got to calculate the time when the new moon happened. And they tell us that it's uh, very accurate. They can calculate it with, with a great degree of accuracy from the year 1800 to the year 2100, that 300 year window there. But any time prior to 1800 or beyond the year 2100, they're not really that accurate. 
So here's a calendar in, uh, from 31 AD in the month of April. This was generally considered the time of the barley harvest, late March or early April. And I want you to notice, if you can, down at the very bottom of the calendar there, along the, uh, the base of the calendar, it's got a black dot for the 10th and then a white dot for the 26th. So the black dot is the new moon, that the, uh, the calculated, the astronomical new moon on Tuesday, the 10th of April in 31 AD. The problem with the 10th day, or the problem with the 10th of the month, is that if you count 14 days into the future, you come to 23rd, or the 23rd of the month. And of course, <clears throat> this isn't the time that Jesus was crucified. This isn't the time when the Passover lamb was supposed to be kept. And so how do we deal with this problem? Well, the Karaite Jews, they went and rather than calculating an, uh, a new moon, they observed the new moon when it just first began to appear. So they called this the first sliver, when the, when the moon just began to have a little bit of light around it, they said, ah, this is the first day of the new month. And so it was something that they observed. It was um, people who saw it would talk to the religious leaders and it would be confirmed and that would be the first day of a new month. Now this uh, darkness of the moon can last for several days. It can take over two days before it appears. Once the astronomical new moon is calculated, it can take a couple of days before this light uh, begins to appear in the night sky. But astronomers tell us, after being lost in the glare of the sun to a, to a naked eye, observers for two, observer for two or three days, the moon is first seen as a thin crescent in the west at twilight, come close to the position of the sun. So as the sun goes down, uh, the moon becomes <clears throat> uh, visible and you can see that little first crescent. That's when the Karaite Jews said, ah, that's the first day of a new month. And then this from uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, this is from, from NASA, the space agency here in America. Uh, and in 1992, they put out this document, the length of the dark period, you know, when you can't see the moon, ranges from roughly two and a half days to four and a half days. That is the two and a half day interval counts from the first, uh, counts from the morning of the first day to the evening of the third day and includes two midnights. So the barley harvest around March or April begins when you see this first sliver, when it, after the dark period is over, and that's the, uh, the new first month, or pardon me, the new uh, first day of that new month. Two weeks later, when we count 14 days after that, because it's the 14th day when uh, the Passover is to be sacrificed, two weeks later, <clears throat> what happens to the moon is it becomes a full moon. So on the first day of the month, it's just this little sliver, but then 14 days later, it becomes a full moon. So again, we look at this calendar and we try to figure out, well, how do we solve this problem where uh, the astronomical new moon is on the 10th. Well, I want to uh, show you here sort of this little animation that maybe help explain that. 
and you'll see the sine waves that represents the uh, the light and dark part of the day. So the <clears throat> as the sun goes down, and this was around four o'clock on the tenth of April in twenty, or pardon me, in thirty-one A.D. Just as the sun went down, the astronomical new moon was calculated at approximately four o'clock in the afternoon. Sunset was at six. So you couldn't see the moon at this time. It was just completely black, completely dark. So the next day on the 11th, the sun and the moon follow in their courses. The sun goes down again, but this sliver is only about 1%. And to the naked eye, it's impossible. You still can't see it. So that can't be the first day either that the Karyat Jews who are observing, trying to see that first sliver, would have looked for. So we go to the next day. And here the sun and the moon follow each other. <clears throat> and now, uh, as the sun is going down on Thursday, uh, the moon becomes visible and just about 4%, you can likely see, unless there was some cloud cover or, or something, of course, we weren't there. We, can't, we don't uh, have any record of, of what was going on astronomically at that time, but you should be able to see, I've got some software that calculates what was going on back then. Uh, it was probably about 4%. But notice the sun has already gone down. And we know that when the sun goes down, a new day begins. So the first opportunity that they may have had to see the new moon would have been on Friday, the 13th of April in 31 AD. That would have been the first opportunity to see it front with the naked eye. So if we see here the 13th uh, <clears throat> is the, uh, the date that is the first of the month, then when you count 14 days ahead, you come to the 26th. You come to the 26th. And of course, if you can see at the base of this uh, calendar, that's when they say the full moon was on the 26th. But of course, the full moon, uh, you know, comes up at night. And once the sun goes down on the 26th, we're really into a new day. So here the sun comes down on the 26th and the full moon is coming up. So you're really looking at it on the 27th on, the, uh, on this Friday, which uh, normally we would call Thursday evening. But since the sun has gone down, it's the dark part of the new day. We're looking at Friday, the 27th of, uh, the 27th of April in 31 AD. Now let's go and look at the final week of Christ's life. So go with me to the New Testament, John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And let's begin uh, reading there. John chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. John 12 and, uh, and verse 1 says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them, that sat at the table with him. So here now is the uh, uh, six days before the Passover, and Jesus is spending the Sabbath in Bethany, spending it at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And uh, all Israel is gathering because uh, pretty soon this is the, the Passover feast that's coming. It's only six days away, and people from all over uh, Israel are coming 
to this feast of the Passover in Jerusalem. And so on the, uh, <clears throat> we see here that on the 14th day, it was to kill the lamb between the evenings. That would have been on the, uh, the 27th, as we've seen there. The 15th day would be a Sabbath, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the 16th day would be when that wave sheaf was, uh, was waved on the 16th day of the week, or pardon me, the 16th day of the month. So the Sabbath at Bethany, uh, the feast at Simon's house is going on. This is where Mary comes and she anoints the feet of Jesus. This is where, where Judas determines in his mind that he is going to betray Jesus Christ. And he leaves this feast and he goes out to the Jews and said, I'm willing to betray Jesus into your hands. If we jump down to verse 12, verse 12 tells us on the next day. So Sabbath is over now. Uh, it's the evening time likely when they, uh, when they had the, the feast there at Simon's house. But this is the next day now. This is Sunday. On the next day, much people were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And they took branches of palm trees. They went forth to meet him and they cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So this is the triumphal entry of Jesus on, the, uh, on Sunday into Jerusalem, where he descends the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem. Notice here from Desire of Ages, it was on the first day of the week that Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So this is on Sunday, but it's, it's late on Sunday. As he gets to the Mount of Olives, um, and he's going down the Mount of Olives to the city of Jerusalem, the sun is already going down. The sun is setting. Notice here again from Desire of Ages, the temple caught the splendor of the setting sun, shining as if with a glory borrowed from heaven. So as Jesus is going into the city, he's going into the city, um, it's at night, it's the sun is going down, and it's the time when uh, he, he goes into the city of Jerusalem. He looks around there at the temple and um, <clears throat> recognizes. Let me see if one more slide here. Here we go. Uh, the triumphal entry, it's in the, it's, the sun's going down. The sun is shining off the temple. It looks beautiful there. But as the sun goes down, now we're into a new day. So this is now Monday. When the sun goes down on Sunday, then we're into Monday. So now let's go to Mark chapter uh, 11. Let's go to Mark chapter 11. And we're going to begin to look here at uh, continuing on with Jesus. So Mark chapter 11 and verse 10. And there it says, blessed be the kingdom. Mark chapter 11, verse 10. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. So as he's coming down the Mount of Olives, it's the sun is going down and he goes into the streets of Jerusalem. The sun has set and he makes his way to the temple. He wants to present himself as the Messiah. Everybody is shouting, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the son of David. He's the Messiah. And he goes to the temple to present himself there as this sacrificial Passover lamb. And remember, they were supposed to uh, set aside the lamb on the 10th day. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem. This is verse 11 now. Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he looked round about upon the things, and now the even was come, he went out to Bethany 
with the 12. So sunsets happened. Jesus goes back to Bethany where he's staying with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then he's going to come in on Monday morning the next day. So verse 12 says, and on the morrow. So this is Monday now. He went out because it was evening. He goes to Mary and Martha's house, but now he's coming back from Bethany on Monday morning. And on the morrow, that's Monday, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And he, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. So Jesus curses the fig tree as he's coming in on Monday morning. And then he goes again to the temple, verse 15. And they, came, they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and he began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and he overthrew the table of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And when even was come, he went out of the city. So on Monday morning, he comes in, he's hungry, he wants something to eat, he's looking for something to eat, he sees this fig tree, oh boy, the leaves are out, so that means the fruit must already be there, but he finds nothing but leaves. So he curses the fig tree, and then he goes to the temple and uh, says, you've, <clears throat> you know, you've, you've made my, my house of prayer into a den of thieves, overturns the, the uh, tables of the money changers, etc. And then when even has come, he goes back out of the city, back to uh, Bethany, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus are staying. So now let's look at verse 20. And here we see again in the morning. So this is the next day. Here comes Tuesday now. Verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up by the roots. So they see the fig tree dried up by the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him. Let me see here. I'll just uh, go ahead and share my screen again. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest, it's withered away. And verse 27 now we're looking at. Verse 27 says, And they come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple. So here's what's happening through this week. Sunday, he, is, uh, he comes into the city, he goes to the temple, then goes back out. Monday, he comes back into town, curses the fig tree, goes to the temple again, and cleans out the money changers, etc. When even comes, he goes back to Mary and Martha's house. He comes back into town again on Tuesday morning, and he's going right to the temple. So it's out to Bethany, into Jerusalem, out to Bethany, into Jerusalem, and he's uh, continuing to go to the temple all the time. Verse 28 Verse 28 now, and behold, uh, pardon me, and say unto him. Did we read verse, to finish off verse 27? No, maybe we didn't. Verse 27, and they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests. There come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And they say unto him, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? So now the fig tree is withered, and they're asking him, who gives you the authority to do what you did yesterday, to cast us out of the temple and to make like you're the authority figure? Who, who are you? So now let's go to chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, as we begin looking at verse 13. Because now the religious leaders are really going to uh, accost Jesus and really uh, try to do everything they can to catch him at his words. 
Mark chapter 12 and verse 13 says, and they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Down to verse 18 of Mark chapter 12. Then come to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, and of course, uh, you know, they went through that little story. Uh, some lady had seven husbands, and who's she going, wife is she going to be in the resurrection? So they're trying to catch him and his words. Now verse 28, and one of the scribes came, and having heard him reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? So now the, the Sadducees have been confounded. Now the Pharisees come and begin asking him questions. And then in verse 34, and when Jesus saw, or pardon me, and and yes, and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. So the Herodians, uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, the scribes, the lawyer, they're, they're all piling on these questions, trying to catch him in his words, because they were very disappointed that they were uh, scared enough to be running out of the temple when Jesus cleansed it the previous day. So now Jesus is leaving the temple for the last time, where he tells them, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So go with me to uh, uh, chapter 13 now, Mark chapter 13 and verse 1. Mark chapter 13, after he's finished or the, all their questions, they're not asking him any more questions. Mark chapter 13 and verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, <clears throat> one of the disciples said unto him, Master, See what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto them, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So now he's left the temple. He's back on his way uh, to Bethany again. And <clears throat> so here we have uh, Tuesday evening. And verse 3 tells us his disciples now come to him privately and talk to him about what he said about the temple. Verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, so they're, they're out now, they're on their way back to Bethany, he's there at the Mount of Olives, over against the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when shall be these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? What are the future events that are going to take place? And so, of course, uh, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus goes over what's going to happen to Jerusalem and what's going to happen to them and eventually tells them what's going to happen right up to the second coming. And then in Matthew chapter 26, he's telling them there's only two days left until the Passover. Matthew 26 and verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, so he's finished talking to them about what's going to happen in Matthew 24, uh, the parables of the last days in Matthew 25. And now it comes to pass, when he's finished all of these sayings, he says unto his disciples, you know that after two days, once two days have passed, it's the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So there's only a couple of days left, Wednesday and Thursday, and then the Passover lamb is to be sacrificed. So now we're going to Mark chapter uh, 14 and verse 12. So we're in Mark chapter 14 now, the next chapter, and verse 12. There it says, And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he, said, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and say unto them, Go ye into the city, and there, you shall, meet, there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. 
follow him. So this is Thursday now, and where are we going to prepare the Passover? And of course, on Thursday evening, when the sun has gone down and they're eating the Passover, this now is what we would call Thursday night, but it's really in Bible time, it's Friday, the dark part of Friday. After the sun has gone down, it's the 14th, uh, the 14th day. So this is Friday now. This is the 27th of April, according to the, the, the calendar here. <clears throat> but the sun has gone down. It's the dark part of the day when they're, when they're eating the Passover. And so it's really on Friday. And supper was ended. The second time uh, Judas goes out and says he's going to betray Jesus Christ. As they leave hear from Desire of Ages. In company with his disciples, the Savior slowly made his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Passover moon, broad and full. Remember, 14 days after you first see the new moon, then 14 days later, the moon's full. The Passover moon, broad and full, shone from a cloudless sky. The city of pilgrims' tents was hushed in the silence. And so here at the full moon, Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And here's where the real battle for your soul and for mine is being fought. Then around midnight or so, the mob comes and takes Jesus away. <clears throat> they go to Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest's house. And then come morning, they take him to Pilate. The sun's rising. It's, the, it's early now. The sun is coming up on Friday morning, and he's standing before Pilate. Then they take him over to Herod, and then they bring him back to Pilate, all beaten with a crown of thorns upon his head. And uh, Pilate says, behold the man. And then, of course, they take him away to be crucified. So let's look at Mark chapter 15 now. Mark chapter 15, and um, <clears throat> we're looking at verse 25. Mark chapter 15 and verse 25. And there it says, and it was the third hour. So this is around in Jewish time, around uh, Bible time, around nine o'clock in the morning. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Now let's look at verse 33. And when the sixth hour, so now that's about noon, that's about uh, 12 o'clock. When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So now there's darkness that covers uh, the area. It's from noon until the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon. Darkness. Now this is not an eclipse as some uh, people who fight against the scriptures would want to tell us because an eclipse only lasts for a few minutes. This is supernatural darkness, um, and you can't have a solar eclipse at a full moon anyway. But um, <clears throat> this lasted for three hours, so it's not an eclipse at all. This is supernatural darkness. Okay, Mark chapter 15 and verse 34. And at the ninth hour, so now this is about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them, which stood by when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed, gave it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see whether Elias will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. So Jesus died about the ninth hour between the evenings at three o'clock in the afternoon, between noon when the first evening begins and six when it's uh, fully evening. Between those evenings, Jesus suffered and died. John 19 verse 30 says, 
When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The sacrifice and oblation ceased. Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work which he came to do. And with his parting breath, he exclaimed, it is finished. The battle had been won. His right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. And now verse 42, Mark 15, 42. <clears throat> and now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So they take down the body of Jesus. Pilate goes, uh, uh, pardon me, Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate, begs the body. They take it down from, uh, from the cross. And then as we read in um, <clears throat> the Gospel of Luke, that they rested according to the Sabbath commandment. So Jesus now is going to rest in the tomb according to the Sabbath commandment. The preparation day, they take him down, but then the Sabbath, according to the commandment, they lay Jesus in the grave. And of course, that can be found in uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse 56. So the next day after the Passover was killed, that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was a Sabbath. They weren't to do any work. And so Jesus is fulfilling both of these as he's resting in the grave. And then, of course, in uh, <clears throat> Luke chapter 24 and verse 1, <clears throat> it says that on the first day of the week, Jesus rises from the grave. They go to the sepulcher and they don't find the body of Jesus. And of course, this is where in the garden, Jesus appears to Mary. <clears throat> and this is the day that the wave sheaf was supposed to be uh, waved, the first fruits of the harvest. And Matthew tells us that many people came out of their graves and went into Jerusalem when Jesus uh, was raised from the dead there. And so Jesus fulfilled all of these things right on time. The Bible predicted the year that Jesus would suffer and die, that he would be cut off for us. It would be in the midst of the week in 31 AD. He would deliver us. <clears throat> it predicted the very month. It would be the first month, what we consider our April. And then it would also be <clears throat> the 14th day of that month, which was Friday, April 27th, and then it predicted the very hour that he would die between the evenings at three o'clock in the afternoon. The devil was completely defeated, and Jesus fulfilled these Passover types exactly in the midst of this final seven-year period in 31 AD. Jesus fulfilled all of these types. And friends, Jesus defeated the enemy and we want to know <clears throat> how important these dates are because they solidify to us the platform of truth and lets us know that Bible prophecies are very, very strong, solid. We can depend upon them. Jesus defeated the devil, but we want to know and we want to ask ourselves the question, is Jesus defeated in pardon me, is Satan defeated by Jesus in our life? Have we decided that Jesus is the one who is our Messiah, who is our King, who is the one who sits on the throne of our heart? As we continue to study uh, tomorrow and, and then on Thursday evening, uh, we're going to finish up with these uh, dates and time prophecies. They're extremely important because we're going to have to give an answer for why we believe what we believe, and we want to have a solid platform for our feet. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for these uh, 
these types where the Passover lamb was to be killed on the 14th day, that it was a Sabbath on the 15th day, that the wave sheaf was supposed to be waved on the, uh, the 16th day. And Jesus fulfilled every single one, not only to the year or the month, but down to the day and the very hour that the Passover lamb was killed. We praise you and thank you for Jesus, our Messiah. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kim, for another wonderful message. And I believe all of us are immensely blessed by his sharing for tonight. So before, I have a quick reminder. Tomorrow, Pastor Kim will continue his fourth workshop at the same time, 9 to 10 o'clock in the evening. And the second reminder, um, tomorrow workshop will start at 6 o'clock in the evening, shared by Raymond and Shandy Tenkano for the third workshop of their family and country living. So don't miss it, 6 o'clock in the evening tomorrow. And lastly, continue to join us for the United Prayer. Uh, we will start 6 o'clock to 6.45 in the morning. 6, 6 o'clock until 6.45 in the morning for the Chinese. And the English will start at 6.50 in the morning until 7.45. So thank you for joining us. And God bless you. Good night. See you tomorrow. <laughs>